Welcome to Season 2 of Overcoming Working Mum Burnout. I'm your host, Dr. Jacqueline Kerr, mum, burnout survivor, and behavior change scientist. I interview international burnout experts, HR and DEI leaders, and lifestyle coaches to find out how we can create individual, organizational, and cultural change to prevent burnout. When mums thrive, the world benefits. This week, I'm learning about setting up your intentional year with burnout coach Laurie Prutzman. I wanted to speak with Laurie because she has a rather dramatic burnout story, and I felt like she made such an important life transition. She also agreed to address New Year's resolutions in this episode. She provides a wonderful alternative approach that I have integrated into this week's Behavior Change Guide, which focuses on finding time to reflect with purpose. You can find the guide and Laurie's key takeaways on the episode website, www.drjacquelinecurr.com slash podcast, including the list of steps to Laurie's intentional year exercise. I wish you all the best for 2022. Hi, I'm Lori Pretzman, and I am the Seattle Burnout Coach. That's my current role. I do coaching for a living, and I live with my husband and our cat, Harley. And uh, I have a daughter who is a senior this year in college, which is hard to believe, but it's happening. So Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Can you please describe your journey to where you are now in your career? Yes, I would. I will start with actually one of my favorite quotes from Brene Brown, which is, if you don't want to burn out, stop living like you're on fire. I love that. I really relate to this because this was me. I'll start with the past and how I became the burnout coach, but this is really the work. This is what happened is really what led me to become the Seattle burnout coach. So I've worked with Fortune 500 companies rising to senior leadership, both at Amazon and Booking.com. And I've always felt really fortunate to have these great work experiences and opportunities with amazing companies. And I think they were a great stepping stones to getting me to where I'm at now. So I've been coaching for about three years. After years of 60 plus hour work weeks and constant travel, I began feeling really burnt out. I felt physically depleted. I had a loss of joy and I just really felt detached from myself and really my own life calling. I felt empty, even though I had great relationships and friends and family and all of that. And I knew that I wasn't happy and I was always feeling kind of panicked and really high anxiety. I was in leadership roles within recruiting. So I was in HR and recruiting and I was very passionate about those roles. I Loved working with candidates and all of my different various business leaders, managing my team, teaching new junior recruiters kind of the way I did recruiting for probably 15 years. So I really loved it. And it was at my previous job that I had at booking.com when I really had my aha wake up moment. So it was during a year where I was flying over 50,000 miles. Our corporate office was based in Amsterdam. So I was traveling back and forth to there as well as all of the Americas because I was running the whole recruiting team for all of the Americas. And I happened to be on a work trip in Florida where I was going to go lead a recruiting training for three days with a bunch of our customer service managers. And I went out in the morning to get some decongestant and I was involved in a car accident. So nothing serious. Somebody just sideswiped the back end of my car. Fast forward, I returned to Seattle. I started doing some chiropractic care right away because I just felt a little bit sore and off. And the problem was that I really didn't take my recover seriously. So after five months, it caught up to me. I had a frozen shoulder. I was not taking any of my doctor's orders. So he had me doing no work travel along with doing a lot of physical therapy, medical massage and acupuncture. But being so busy and so important and having so much work, I didn't have time for that. Work was the number one thing. And it honestly 
it wasn't until I was physically and mentally imploding, literally, that I finally decided to focus on healing and took a medical leave of absence for three months. And wow, uh, that was the best three months of my life. I focused on me and me only, which was very hard at first. I didn't know how to do that. And honestly, you don't realize how tethered you are to your laptop, your cell phone. But more importantly, it was the need to be needed. And I just, I felt like I was walking around a little bit like a zombie. Like, what do I do? What's my purpose? Who am I? So taking that time to really step back and reflect, I realized a couple of things. I realized that I had lost myself. I lost sight of my true self. Everything became about work. It was my whole identity. It was all about beating targets and hiring the best employees and training. And all of that was so important to me that I made myself always available. I was always available to managers, my team, candidates, honestly, anybody who needed me. And I would feel shame if I left work without completing it. And the work is never done, right? I I, I was leading a team of recruiters for all the Americas. So Work is never done. Managers everywhere always need something. And I just was so tightly wound. I felt like I couldn't even breathe at times. And my husband and my daughter both have many stories they could share of this experience of me and who I, honestly, who I can say now who I used to be. Through support of my husband, who was definitely ready for me to give up a 70 hour work week, I realized that I needed a change of pace and honestly work focus altogether. So for me, it was like, while corporate America was great, It just wasn't for me anymore. I could never say no. And I knew that about myself. And I knew that it wasn't healthy for me to continue to keep myself in those situations. I quit my job after my three-month leave of absence. I I took a year-long coaching certification program, which honestly changed my life for the better. And that's what really led me to do this work and to manage my own burnout and to work through that process And now I have a a coaching practice where I'm helping clients abandon their own burnout and really reclaim their authenticity and their joy and, you know, how they want to show up in the world. That's an incredible story, Laurie. I I have a few questions around it or just comments too. I, I think it shows up in so many of us physically, and it was almost like you needed that catalyst of the accident to make it show up even more strongly for you. So I I know so many people in sharing their burnout stories, we think it's our bodies let us down, but it's really just communicating with us. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And then I had the similar experience to you. I took a three month leave of absence, but then I did go back and leave because I just couldn't see how I could survive in that environment. And I, I agree when you start to recognize in yourself something like you find it very hard to say no. I think it's really important. You can work on those things, but I think it's also very important to see that. I call it that environment personality fit, because I think that there are two sides to it. And that's what I saw with myself is I wasn't going to be able to do well in this type of environment that that constantly asked for more. I remember even doing an exercise around that because I I had started some coaching and the coach said, okay, you have to start saying no more often. She said, start tracking it, start tracking your yeses and nos. And in that process of tracking my yeses and nos, I suddenly realized, oh my God, how many times a week am I being asked to do new things? And I didn't even realize it. So I can imagine in your situation too, you were on 24 seven around the world. That's just Oh yeah. Incredible. And I'm a helper by nature. I know we'll talk about that, but I want to say, yes, I want to help people. And I also tried, I I can go back to work. I can make this work. It's a new me. I've learned how to breathe and meditate and this will be fine. And it literally took three days back in the office. And I just said, nope right back where I was. I knew it wasn't going to work. And then I had a very similar experience. I remember that first day back, three people came to me asking if I could mentor them. And I literally was like, I don't know how to say no, thinking I had learned. Um, So had you been getting coaching that motivated you to go do your own coaching certificate? Or did you just go, 
hey, I want to do this new thing. Yeah. So back when I was at Amazon, so this would have been probably what, seven, eight years ago, mm-hmm. I started seeing a coach just because I was in this place of, wow, what else could I do with an Amazon? Do I want to stay in recruiting? What do I want in my life? And I've always been a person that strives to better myself. So any kind of self-help or things like that. And I had a friend really recommend this coach that I went to. She was a master coach here in Seattle. And I saw her. And at that time, I just started thinking I I was more enamored and interested in the process she was leading me through and the work that she was doing with me. And I kept thinking I could do this. Like, I love the juiciness of it. And helping people, again, it's the helping people. So I put that on the back burner, went through my coaching and I realized the power of coaching. And she taught me a lot about myself and stayed at Amazon and then went on to booking. And then I, my husband knew that I had always, gosh, I love coaching. I'm going to get a coach. I could be a coach, maybe someday. In reality, when I went into recruiting God, 15 to 20 years ago now, I really wanted to do coaching. But I was young in my career. I was single at the time. I did not have the means at all to take that on. So I went into recruiting because it was the next best thing for me in terms of being able to help Pete. I was in sales prior to that. So I went into recruiting and I was able to help people. But then getting into coaching, I realized I've had a lot of experience. I've coached a lot of candidates. I've coached a lot of managers and employees and all of that. But I really wanted the nuts and bolts. I needed to get into the true training and the teaching of how to help create change. And the gift, the true gift of a good coach is to sit back and listen and ask really good questions. And you have to be fully present in order to do that. So going through a coaching program is what really did it for me because it really taught me how to. Which is so important around burnout too. It's a skill that you needed for your clients, but it's a fantastic skill for ourselves as well. Yes, absolutely. So let's talk about that a little more. How do you help women with burnout? And the fact that you really did focus, you could have been a coach of all sorts of things, but you decided to focus on burnout. So tell me about that decision and and how particularly you help women with burnout and and then about the moms you work with. You were a mom yourself and had such great insight into that. So tell me about that. It's funny. I fought my branding people. I have two women that I worked with when I first decided I should probably have a website and become a legitimate coach and worked together with them for, honestly, it was about six or seven months developing kind of my brand, who I am, who I want to show up as in the, as the world. And I honestly, in the beginning, I just, I wanted to help everybody. So people would say, you have to have a niche. What kind of coach are you? I'm a coach who can help anybody. Okay. We can't market that. You need to stop saying that. So long story short, it just hit like a lightning bolt one day. And the woman who developed my brand looked at me and she said, you're the bleeping burnout coach. And I said, what? No, I don't like that. Sounds negative. Nope. Don't like that. And I can't help people who aren't in burnout. Is that what that means? So long story short, we decided to land on the burnout coach. And I sat with that for about a week before I would commit to it. And the more I started telling my friends and family about it, they were like, oh my God, that's so obvious for you. Yes. So that's how I landed on burnout. And I obviously coach people on more than just burnout, but that's primarily what we focus on. With the women I work with who are moms, I think the number one thing I notice is that they are not present in their bodies. So they're not present physically or emotionally when I first start working with them. So they're running their lives in their heads. It's all from the neck up. And of course their heart, because they're a mom and they love, but it's about love for others, not love for themselves. And they've gotten so used to taking care of everyone and everything but themselves. Plus you throw in a pandemic, right? Just on the edge. That is really how I've been experiencing a lot of moms that I've worked with. According to the help side and what has been working, I don't have one size fits all for burnout help. It's not like I'm a coach who says, do these three steps and you will avoid burnout. That's not it at all. 
everything is messy and different. So I truly have individual and personal journeys with each of my clients as theirs are so personal, the, the, the issues they're going through and they're different. But where I come in the beginning is really securing the space, trust and compassion for them so that they really feel heard and seen. That's really the first step because they are not taking times for themselves. So someone needs to. So I ask a lot of deep questions at the beginning when I start working with clients and often the support starts with getting their bodies into it and their hearts and their feelings about what they're experiencing because they've truly lost touch. So oftentimes I'll do visualization practices with my clients. When I notice in the moment that they're getting heated about something or emotional or frustrated, I do a lot of my coaching is watching for body language and I'll slow down and ask them if they're willing to do a visualization, close their eyes. And it's a lot of breathing and deep questioning. How does that feel in your body? Trying to get them in touch with their whole self because they're not realizing that signals they're getting from their gut or the way they're feeling or the tension that they're carrying, that it's there or what could potentially be causing it. And then it's followed by a lot of small practices for them to focus on and take on. Just like you shared, your coach had you taking a list of when you say yes and when you say no. It can be little things like that. And the first part of it is for my clients, these women to really have the courage to set boundaries and ask for what they know. The best person I think to help you recover from burnout, unfortunately, is yourself, right? Nobody can do this for us. It really is about some self-management. And you know what I mean by this is that it's really about, you have to start with slowing down and stopping for a minute just to recognize what is truly going on within yourself. And it's a critical time for you to be really real with yourself. And I get them to ask themselves, what am I feeling right now? But the key to all of this is doing it without judgment. That's the other piece, right? Because we want to say things like, I don't have time for this. It's not important. It's not about me, but it is. Once you can recognize that, I think it's easier to start setting boundaries. Part of that is strengthening the work and private life barriers. So you can't always be on, you can't always be available and you really have to take you time. And oftentimes women, it takes a while for them to even understand that they're in burnout because the emotional and the mental and the physical symptoms of burnout are often unseen, or they just think, oh, maybe I'm just stressed out, or maybe it's just an off day or off week. But if you're experiencing burnout or sensing it, that it's coming, the worst thing to do is to try to bury it and just carry on. So I think it's important to talk to someone you trust. It could be a colleague, a family member, a therapist, or a coach, but definitely it's not about pushing the feelings down and trying to ignore them. I've had great success with my clients when I'm just so blessed to be a part of that journey and know that they got it. They know how to self-correct now. They know how to notice these things and prevent them. If you can prevent your own burnout and become more compassionate and empathetic with yourself, you can have an outcome of joy and being present and being at peace and having connectedness. And you can really be happy and successful at work too. Like it, it actually can happen. That's so great. And it's funny when you first started describing that where mums are from the heads up, oh my God, I got emotional there because you're so right. I was totally heads up mom. And I felt so comfortable in that space. My brain to me is the thing that works best in my body, <laughs> you know, that I trust the most. All those moving parts is just what my brain loves. And it's so funny because e even recently I was reminded of that. So I had shared with you before as well that my husband broke his leg. And the first thing he says to me from his hospitals miles and miles away from me in that moment, when I spoke to him on the phone, he goes, don't start planning stuff. <laughs> and I was like, okay, so I waited 24 hours, but then really I realized, okay, everything's going to change in the next, I thought a couple of weeks, it's been four months now. And, and, and it, we're still struggling to get everything back on track, but it's just, I went into that headspace and then my body let me down again. I got this neck strain, but I was totally back into that. I can manage this in my head. And I can, I'm really good at that. But then I do think I totally forget about my body and my feelings. So I, I, I really think that speaks um, so 
clearly to how I imagine a lot of moms are going to be feeling as they listen to this. That's where they, that's where they live. Yeah. And that's really at the core too. Like the, the coaching I'm doing is, is called the integral coaching. And what that means is integrating your whole self, right? Every day you show up in this shell of a body, but inside is your head, heart, and your gut. All three work together. So you can't just put one on the side and say, today, I think I'm just not going to go with anything in my head. I'm just going to do everything from my heart, but that's not going to show up very well. Or today I'm just going to be in my head and forget the fact that I feel hungry or I have a headache or I don't feel well, or I'm emotional. So it really is about getting my clients to just check in with their whole self and ask the question, what do I need? What do I need? Laurie, you also mentioned setting boundaries. Oh my goodness. This is a really hard one for me. The same as the not being able to say no. (laughs) So I'm going to get some free coaching here. I love it. (laughs) How do you get started with this as a chronic people pleaser? Oh boy. Yeah. (laughs) How long have we got? Exactly. Right. This actually was the crux of me when I started my coaching program, because within the first three months of a coaching program, I remember showing up all bright eyed, teach me how to coach. And they said, Whoa, pump the brakes. The first three months of this year long journey is about you. And it's all about being with yourself, focusing on yourself. And I thought, ew, I don't want to have to do that. Thank God we had to do that. Honestly, because this is where I learned how to set boundaries. For me, honestly, it was realizing that if I don't take care of me, there's nothing left to give to anyone. And as a coach, I would be worthless if I showed up on empty for every session, for every client, like I would not have a business. It's really important to understand why it's so important for you to be a pleaser, like getting to the depth of that. So you need to really dig deep on that. This is what I found from my experience and the way I work with my clients. But everybody has a this people pleaser, this need to be a perfectionist, this need to be driven, this need to provide, be the smartest one in the room. All these things are about pleasing at the end of the day. And sometimes it has to happen with a coach. I did that work. That's how I learned that I don't need to please everybody so much. And the number one person I should be pleasing is myself. And then I learned the power of setting boundaries and the power of saying no. I literally just got goosebumps. It is awesome. And it's also terrifying at the beginning. It was really difficult. And you have to start with baby steps. It is about being able to say, let me get back to you. I need to check my schedule. I'm not sure if I can take that on right now versus, yeah, sure. I can do it. Anything you want. That automatic response. Yes. And that was my built-in. Always yes. Always the yes girl. So really, again, and I'm still on this journey, right? I've been coaching now for three and a half years and I'm still learning how to set boundaries. It just, it still wants to creep up because deep in me, I lead with my heart and I am this pleaser of people and I want to make people happy and help people and take care of people. So it is important to be able to step back just for your own emotional state of being and being able to take care of yourself to be able to say no. And it's even setting boundaries, not just necessarily with other people, but for myself. Okay. You've been in this state now for X amount of hours. We're going to give it another half hour and then we're going to try something else. So there's a lot of self-talk that goes on always. And I think that does help though, is knowing what are the boundaries? They can be very small boundaries. They they don't have to be huge things that you step in with. So that's the biggest thing I would say about setting boundaries. It's a big part of my coaching work that I do. Great. And maybe I can also then transition there. I agree that it's always going to be a journey. I feel like I want this end, but I'm still learning to accept that it will always be work and and that things are going to change. So what do you do in your own life to to help you prevent burnout? Do you have a symptom that comes up that helps you know when you're getting into that space and and how do you manage it? First and foremost, and this I have honestly learned again within the last couple of years, and it all started when I was in my coaching program and I had a coach that taught me how to look for the signs of burnout prevention and managing your stress. But first and foremost, I would say for me, I've really learned to listen and respect my whole self, meaning my body, my heart, and my mind. 
And I know when something is out of sorts. I know how I act. I know when I'm stressed out. I know my behaviors. I know what I go to do. And so I will just honestly, I take a slowdown. I take a timeout. I might go in a room and close the door and sit by myself for a minute with no distractions and just slow down and listen to that first. What is going on? I get really curious. Just what, wow, what's going on right now? Why am I acting like this? Or why am I feeling like this? So I think slowing down and listening, that always helps me in every situation. And then I learned how to set healthy boundaries for me. And I always put me first now. Because guess what? No one else is going to do that for me. So I've learned to say, okay, what do I need? Check in with me. It's all about me. And then it's not about me. So I've learned to diffuse, honestly. And I've also learned how to step back when I'm riled up because I'm a very passionate, hard on my sleeve. I get fired up easily type of person. And if, wow, the last two years have taught us nothing, it really is to take a breath for a minute and step back and breathe. Deep breaths and deep breathing honestly always help me. I do that practice a lot with my clients. Oftentimes I help them get centered even at the beginning of a call by just saying, okay, I know you just came off of a busy week or a busy hour or whatever. Let's take a couple deep breaths and get centered and focus on you. So I do that a lot for myself. It's not always that easy though. I know I make it sound like it's easy. It's not that easy. I don't just come from this place of Zen every second. So what helps me stay balanced and what's important for me is relationships that support me because I have gotten rid of the ones that do not support me. I do not have time for that. And I also do a lot of mindfulness practices and meditation. I do some journaling. I also do a lot of gratitude practices that support me, especially when I'm in times of sorrow or pain. And I've been feeling a lot of that the last couple of years, just from my own full knee replacement surgery and some of the grief and loss that I've had with family members. So I find that practicing gratitude really does support me. And I don't push my emotions down anymore. I full on feel them. I express them. I question them. I get really curious about them. And then I support what I need. So recently I've suffered a loss of a really close family member. So there's been a lot of crying, which is okay. And it's healthy. So if more importantly, it's about just letting it out. Like you've got to have an outlet. You've got to be able to say, I feel safe. I feel like I can sit and cry if I need to, or do whatever that may be. But I will say my favorite thing to do to prevent burnout is riding my Harley. That is honestly my true Zen headspace. Fresh air in my lungs and just the wind in my face and taking in the beauty of nature and being outside, just, mm, it it is the best. So I have found what works for me and that's it. That's great. Thank you for sharing those personal tips. And it is inspirational. You just saying, I put me first, having heard how you just didn't do that to realize you definitely do that now, even though that takes work, that is, that is inspirational because I'm definitely not there yet, but I can see myself on the journey to getting there. So I, I really appreciate that. And we'll talk a little bit more about some emotional burnout in terms of uh, where we're all feeling at the moment and, and how people can help cope with grief. We'll do that at the end just to, to spare ourselves. <laughs> so let's um, transition back to the experience you and I both had of actually leaving our jobs due to burnout and transitioning from, say, corporate life into a different job or into a different type of job. That is part of burnout. So it's something that you do help women with. So tell us a little bit more about that process. I I certainly did. I certainly burnt out and transitioned and left my jobs. Not to say everybody has to leave their job. It's not that I'm a coach that is out there saying, just quit your job, but definitely helping in transition or even just being able to support my clients and having the conversation about it. I'm fortunate that I had a three month leave of absence from work so that I could truly take time to discover what I really wanted to do and what I really valued in my life. And I would say if people are considering this, and this is the conversation again, I have with clients is that it's really important to first slow down for a few, right? So you're not making rash, harsh decisions, 
but you have to take the time to take inventory of what truly matters to you and in your life, what is going to support you and what, you know, does not support you before you jump into the next thing. Cause oftentimes people think, oh, if I just change jobs, it's all going to be better. And oftentimes they're making it worse for themselves. But one thing I do know is that you should always go with your gut. If you are looking at that transition, taking that time and knowing and saying, Hey, my gut is telling me something here, right? If your whole self is giving you signs of burnout, you really should pay attention to that. That's the cue. That's the sign. And again, you don't know any of that until you can stop for a minute and slow down and start asking yourself questions. What's going on? Why am I feeling like this? I wonder what this could be without judgment. So, you know, after my leave, I considered staying at my job, like I mentioned to you, and I thought maybe things would change and I could go back and I could just be in this Zen place. and It would be a healthy workplace. And I tried, but every fiber of my body said, so I listened. So transition can be scary as hell. I'm not going to lie. The thought of not pulling my weight, not bringing in a big income, having to start a new business from the ground up. It was like, who do I think I am? I cannot do this. Imposter syndrome can be huge. Questioning abilities and my own personal value. Like how could I do this? But I had a really strong inner knowing because I started to listen to my whole self and all the signs. And that kept me on the path of becoming a coach. I just said, there's got to be something better out there for me. And I'm going to take a risk. And I think it's important when doing that, of making sure that you have a support system of some kind, right? Whether it's a, a coach, a therapist, a friend, a family member. For me, my biggest support team was my husband, as well as my personal coach that I was working with. And being able to feel like you can have these conversations in a safe place that's a way to help with a healthy transition. If you do leave your job and you do go through this. And when I'm helping other women and considering their transition and kind of options that they would have and what they can do, they become really empowered about choosing their life and their destiny. I offer a lot of guidance and listening and a safe place for them to really process it all, but it's coaching. So I never give them the answer. I never tell them what to do. I give them support and confidence to make their own powerful life decisions. So that's a little bit about how I support with transitions like this. Right. Because I think it's such an important part of many people's burnout journeys. And just sticking with the companies a little bit, you worked for so many companies and we talked about it being an environment personality fit. But what are some of the things that you think companies could do more often? What are you hearing from mums that they wish companies could also try to do more? First and foremost, address burnout. 5,000 exclamation points after that, right? Sorry, I'm very passionate about this topic. Yeah, it's, no, you're right. You're right. That's such a good answer. No one's answered that before for me either in that way. Thank you. Or the potential for burnout in their companies. Here's the deal. Burnout does not have to be a dirty word for the company to think about or for the individual who's going through that burnout. We need to talk about it. We need to bring it to the attention of leadership. We need to start creating a culture where it can be discussed. We need to ask these moms and these employees what they need. So honestly, it really starts with a conversation at the top. So I think as we know, leadership sets the culture of an organization. So it's time to rethink what will make for a healthier environment where employees want to be a part of one that can be supportive and productive and creative and still do meaningful work. And there are a lot of companies actually that are starting to address burnout. Sidebar here real quick. As a burnout coach, I have a Google alert where every day I get 20 plus articles on the word burnout. Needless to say, I do a lot of research on this topic and I am starting to see this coming up more in companies. People are addressing it. People are talking about it. We've had some of the biggest times ever where people are just quitting their jobs. Hey, can't handle it anymore. Going to quit my job. So I think that's where it starts. And there are a lot of great companies that are doing really good things. There's a a local company here that I'm going to brag about for a second called Reverb. They're a Seattle-based HR consulting company, and they do all kinds of different things. And this started really when burnout started becoming very prevalent with COVID. 
but they're doing things like let's get outside, let's do a team hike or a team walk. Let's discuss a, a project over a walk instead of over Zoom since we're not in the office any longer. They're doing check-ins that are including, and this is everybody having this conversation, male and female, saying, how are you doing? Checking in with people. And it's not just about work. It's about the person. How are you doing? How's it going at home, homeschooling two kids? How's it going with your family that is ill? All that stuff. They're giving unlimited PTO for their staff so that they don't feel, oh my gosh, I can't take any time off and I have too much work to do. And they're also really quick at delegating work or looking outside to get other help or more people in, even if it's for a contract basis or whatever, so that their people are not working more than 40 hours a week. So I think there's lots of things out there, but it definitely needs to be talked about. A lot of the moms that I'm working with are sharing that they're scared to lose their jobs if they don't work as hard as the next person. They don't have the energy oftentimes. Their home lives are suffering. Their kids' lives are suffering because of it. So there was a recent survey that was done, an employee burnout survey. And this company surveyed a thousand full-time employees across the U.S. from different career levels and experiences at the workplace. 89% of those people have experienced burnout. 89%. That is a lot of people. 70% would leave their job for one offering resources to reduce burnout. And employees feel uncomfortable talking to their supervisor about burnout. And by gender, that's 30% of men and 42% of women. So I think there's plenty of opportunity for companies to embrace this topic and devise a plan to help their employees, especially working moms, so that they feel supported and not threatened in the workplace. Thank you. That's so great to share some of those statistics and those examples and some of the ideas you came up with there. I I appreciate that. So one of the things as a behavior change scientist, I'm really trying to always help people think about what's something that they can get started on today. Today will be January when this uh, podcast airs. So let's combine a behavior change idea plus, okay, when is the right time to do a behavior change? What's your thoughts about New Year's resolutions and whether they work or not? (laughs) I know some of the work from Katie Milkman in her book, they talk about fresh starts are a good opportunity, but to be honest, most New Year's resolutions do not work. So tell me about how you think people can approach something they can do and and when's the right time to do it or how do we frame it in a positive way so we're not feeling like we're failing. (laughs) Isn't that funny? It is. It's that piece of failure. And I'm so happy you brought this question up. I've learned for myself honestly, over the last probably three years that I'm not big on new year's resolutions. And that's only because I fail and I know I fail. Right. And then I get to beat myself up for it. And I'm pretty hard on that failure. Like a lot of people are when we fail, it's not good. They're usually big resolutions and they lose importance after January. It fizzles out. They don't feel attainable, even though they sound very bold and brave in the moment, but they just don't work. So what's funny is because I actually have started doing in the last couple of years, I offer a women's retreat in the first quarter of each year, and it's called your intentional year. And this is how I set up my year. So it's really about giving yourself time to first reflect. So you're reflecting on the previous year and then you're renewing and saying what's important. And then you're really able to step into this new year with wholehearted clarity. And it's not about these little have to lose 50 pounds without anything else around that to support it or whatever. Right. I love that. My intentional year. Yeah. And this is what I do. I'll give you a quick synopsis of how I lead and some of the questions. So for your listeners here, they can jot down some of these questions and help themselves plan and do this. I would say it's really powerful again, to start reflecting about the previous year and look at it and review, take a Saturday or a Sunday or something, or when you have some downtime, a couple hours, get cozy, break out the calendar and just look and review what you did month by month, the previous year. So break it down in terms of your personal life and your family life. Look at things like your health, look at things like your work, your studies or your profession, your community, emotional and spiritual health, 
finances, even your bucket list. Did you attempt to do anything on your bucket list? And then you make some powerful statements to summarize that all up. And what I mean by that is powerful statements like the wisest decision I made last year, right? The biggest risk I took, the biggest surprise for the year, the most important thing I did for other people, the biggest thing I completed. What are you most grateful for? The best thing you discovered about yourself. And then most important, this is my favorite part. What do I want to let go of in order to move into the new year? And the second piece to that is who or what needs to be forgiven in order to move on. So that's really a way to look and reflect on the last year. And then moving into the new year is looking at things like, what are your big dreams? Like big dreams. It's okay to dream big and pretend it's a perfect world. Don't say I could do this except for COVID won't allow it. It's block out the negative, block out the judgment, just dream. Think about things that you want to achieve. Think about things that you dare to discover about yourself or others. What relationships do you want to work on? What will you have the power to say no to? What do you want to make a priority? How will you pamper yourself? Three things that you'll do for yourself every morning. And then break it down again into bigger statements, powerful statements of this year. I'll advise myself to dot, dot, dot. This year, I will draw strength from. This year will be special to me because of. And give yourself a powerful word for the year. What is one power word for you that you really want to live into? And I will plaster that word everywhere. I have it in my bathroom on a sticky note on my mirror. I have it in my car. I have it in my office. Last year, my word was resilience. And boy, oh boy, have I been living that in 2021. So it really is about baby steps again, doing this work and then taking something to focus on and not feeling like you're setting yourself up for failures or things that you're going to focus on in just January. They call it new year's resolution. It's not new January resolution. Really think about planning it for the year. And what do you want that to look like? And then taking time to touch base with yourself, maybe at the end of each month and look at that and say, Hey, how did I do? Where am I at? Take your temperature. That sounds such a powerful process, Laurie. I love that it's reflection and and thinking forward and all those statements sound like things that would be great to do. Not this one, like you say, lose this amount of weight that just weighs on you. It sounds like a fun and empowering process. So we'll definitely link everybody to details of Laurie's work in the website. Each episode has a website and all the additional information will be on there. So let's end with going back to where we think people might also be in. So this could be part of their process of thinking back over the last year as well and admitting this. And I think one of the things that you said about the leaders in workplaces leading by example, I can imagine a lot of them are burned out and afraid to admit it or afraid to show that by example, that they're burned out and afraid to take a break or afraid to admit this. And this was something we talked about feeling that everyone could be in this state of emotional burnout. And that as you shared personally, you've suffered a lot of grief lately. And it feels like a lot of people are, I think if we're in this state of emotional burnout, anything additional that's hitting us is really knocking us back more. So if you feel comfortable, can you just share a little bit about that journey so that others who are feeling this grief and emotional burnout could also learn from your example? I I have experienced a lot, what I call and refer to with my clients as emotional burnout. So the thing that started my year off was I had a full knee replacement in March of this year. And even though my doctors told me it will take a full six to 12 months to recover from this, for some reason, I thought I possessed superpowers and I would be over it in about a month or two. And clearly that was not the case, but when you're going through something like this, you're going through a a physical trauma to your body or a sickness or an illness, and you're going through this 
it, it is easy to get sucked into a rabbit hole of worry and dread and sadness and feeling defeated and just feeling beat up and feeling like I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel and just wanting to give up. I really struggled with this because I wanted to have a year where I could be supportive of my clients and do a lot of great work. But when you're on really high level pain pills and trying to take care of yourself, you can't be there for anybody else. So I had to take a couple of months off of work completely. And that does not go well for me sitting and just staying, you know, in one position and not getting out not being able to ride my Harley. It's been a really difficult year for that. Add on top of that, again, pandemic going on, the stress of the media and the news cycle and everything else that's going on. And it takes a toll. I got to say, I think I've cried more this year than I have a lot of years in the past. And so I, I started by just grieving a lot of what was going on for me, grieving the fact that I couldn't be social and be out with my friends and even get in my car and drive and go anywhere I wanted or just do the normal things. I couldn't go to the grocery store. All of that just starts to weigh on you. So I think, again, taking time to just breathe. And that is more than ever when you truly need a support system. And that starts by having to reach out though. So Part of that I knew was on me. I needed to reach out. I needed to talk to other people. I needed to seek support. And the, the amount of support, the friends, the family, the people that showed up for me, I'm so grateful. I mean, my heart is so big because of it. And then this summer, it just ha started happening rapid fire. One of my dearest girlfriends, she lost her husband, who was a dear friend of ours as well. He was 52 years old, died of a sudden heart attack just out of the blue. You don't plan for that. You're not ready for that. So I just really started grieving that loss. And I was sad. I was sad. I was mad. I was terrified because I, my husband and I are in that same age bracket. It can happen to anyone. It really starts you thinking about what's important, what matters. The most difficult one for me was um, on September 18th, I lost one of my favorite uncles who was like a father figure to me. And he was my Harley coach and mentor. He was very beloved and it was very sudden. And I have been really sad for the last probably three to four weeks and trying to cope. And the helper in me wants to just get in there and help everybody else. And I started to go down that path and realize I wasn't honoring my own grief. And so his funeral was on the 9th of October. And I was giving myself until that time and through the rest of the weekend. But when I got home a week ago, last Monday, I thought, Hey, it's time for me to get busy. I need to get back to work and get back to my routines. It's going to support me. And I couldn't do it. I had a couple days in a row where I just sat in my pajamas on my sofa, binging Netflix, because it's all I could do. I, I couldn't make dinner. It was really rough. But what I did was allow that to happen. My husband and I were in the same boat. So we just supported each other. We cried, we laughed, we shared stories and we're honoring not only him, but we're honoring our own grief and just being present with it. Because one thing I've learned is that pushing down emotions and trying to show up and be strong and not be vulnerable is the worst thing you can do for yourself. That's what I've been doing to try to support myself in that. And I know I'm going to have a good day. Today's a good day. And I know I could have a bad day right around the corner. And so it's just being present and aware of what's happening and giving yourself this. Thank you so much for sharing that, Laurie, because I know, like we said, it can be so uncomfortable to be vulnerable. But I think as leaders see your example, hopefully they would feel that they could do the same and have a pajama and Netflix week and let people know that you're suffering. Like you say, you have to share that for people to be able to be there to support you. Thank you so much, Laurie. I really appreciate um, your approach to burnout, your vulnerability yourself, the example you have as that burnout coach and everything you've shared with us today. It's just been incredible. Thank you. I'm 
clearly very passionate about burnout and the more we can talk about it and get it out in the open, I think the better off everybody will be. Thanks so much for listening. You can find additional resources on my website, drjacquelinecurr.com. Please send me feedback and your ideas for episodes or guests and subscribe or follow wherever you listen. And please remember, burnout can be related to serious health problems. If you're experiencing physical or mental health symptoms, please contact a health provider or call the appropriate helpline. This podcast does not replace medical advice. Take care. Control, you're a fighter. Push the limits and see it. You're already there. Told you we going higher. Ain't no stopping us. We're going in for the win. And we're gonna celebrate. Then we're gonna do it all over again. And we're gonna rock this place. Cause this is our day. Everything that you need and more is with